Did I give you a copy, Naomi? All right, I couldn't remember. You need a copy? You don't need one. You saw it at home. I don't have another copy. I don't. You'll have to sit by Ivan. You'll have to do it from memory. <laughs> I finally got smart and used this. I was like, where's, where's Ron and Sam getting that at? Well, now I found out. Well, good evening, everybody. It's good to see everybody that came out tonight. I know the weather's less than ideal, but we have four-wheel drive. So we are going to pick up in the book of James, chapter 1. We left off two weeks ago, and last week I wasn't here. Um, so we want to finish chapter 1. So you might want to be turning there right now. Before we go into the class, let's bow and go to the Father in prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the blessing of this day. We thank you for the opportunity that you've given each one of us to be out tonight. We're thankful that we've all made it here safe. We are so thankful that Sam and Julie are back in our presence. We're so thankful for others that have had illnesses of various kinds in recent weeks and months that have recovered. We pray for those that have lost loved ones for whatever reason. Um, we pray for the loss of, I can't remember the name, uh, our sisters uh, here, her mother had passed. Uh, and you know who this, who this is, and we pray for them as well. And uh, we also ask that you be with us tonight as we study your word, that we would do it in a manner that's well-pleasing unto you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. I'm sorry, I forgot who passed. Okay, sorry about that. But we do want to remember them in prayers. It's always a rough time when a loved one passes away. <clears throat> so, uh, the handout that you've been given a few moments ago, if you would like to turn to page five, A couple of points I'd like to make before we get into the text, and we can find those on page five. Trials, trials, yesterday and today. Trials, trials, please go away. Uh, I think that's something that we all face, our trials. And we'd rather not go through them sometimes. I think that they, welcome guys. I think that they, well, they try us. And we kind of like to have a smooth life as much as possible. But I think as we've studied, we realize that there's values in trials. And these, these trials help us to get through a bigger trial and a bigger trial. And we need to learn to go through these trials. Somebody said that a trial is kind of like trying to hold on to a basketball underwater. And you can do it for so long. You ever tried that? Take a basketball and you're in the pool or something or whatever, hold that underwater and try as you may, it will, it'll pop up. So we'll have trials, we'll be able to kind of keep them under control, but they're going to they're keep coming up in our lives. 
And so the important point here that we want to talk about is there's a difference between a trial and a temptation. And that's the beginning of um, page five here. Just to rehash a little bit so we understand. So a, a trial is a, is a testing of one's character, an outward circumstantial opportunity to sin. And a temptation is an enticement rooted in our own, in, excuse me, in one's own lust to do wrong or lead others to do so, the inward desire to sin. James 1.14, but each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. So we need to realize that God allows us to go through trials to strengthen our faith, to strengthen our courage, to strengthen ourselves, but he doesn't tempt us. For God to be able to tempt us, he would have to be a, for lack of a better word, he'd have to be rather sadistic, I would think. He would have to be like, I'm going to put this there and I'm going to tempt them to do wrong, tempt them to sin. Uh, he, 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 he doesn't, he doesn't uh, he, he's sinless, of course, and he doesn't want to put, he wouldn't put these things in front of us. He couldn't, because of his nature, he wouldn't be able to, to do that. He does allow us to be tried, though. And we talked about the three main categories of sin, lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, the boastful pride of life. And Ron was talking on Sunday about uh, there's two broad categories of sin, the sin of omission and the sin of commission. I think we know what those are. The sins of commission are things that we, we commit. We know to, not to do them, but we do them anyways. The sins of omission are sins that we know to do something. It would be the right thing to do this, fill in the blank, but we, we choose not to do it. So those are the two broad categories of sins. Let's skip down now to the bottom where it says example of great trial. <clears throat> when I was thinking about preparing the lesson about trials, I thought of Abraham. So let's read here. Abraham endured perhaps the greatest trial to ever come upon mankind. And that trial was to offer up for, for sacrifice Isaac, his only son with Sarah, through whom the seed promised to Abraham would be made, that all the nations would be blessed through his seed. Genesis chapter 12, 1 through 3. Only Isaac could be the rightful heir to the promise. Isaac, being both heir to Abraham and the only rightful one able to fulfill all of God's promises and his eternal purpose for mankind. So obviously Isaac is vital in the lineage of Christ. He's vital in the plan that God has for us. And so Abraham was tested or tried by God. So Genesis 22, 1, 2, and 3, Now it came about after these things that God tested or tried Abraham and said to him, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. He said, Take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. Imagine if that were to be one of us today. If God were to, uh, this would be what we heard. Uh, I mean, that would be not, not something that, that would be an easy thing probably to do. So, but look, we have no indication of hesitation or pondering on the part of Abraham to follow God's command. Verse 3 tells us that he, that is Abraham, arose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, split wood, took two of his young men with him, and went to the place that God had told him, the mountains of Moriah. So he just did it. He didn't. We have no indication of him hesitating or no indication of him, well, oh, should I do this? Should I not do this? He just did it. Uh, he had, there was no indecisiveness, at least that we're not told of it. So also of interest here is the amount of time that it took for him to travel to God's chosen destination. It was about a three days journey. So you can imagine in all that time, three days for Abraham to, those thoughts might, might kick in, you know, I'm not sure this is a good idea, you know, and he had, he had all this time to 
And that was part of the, the trial, I think, a, a thorough testing of, the, of Abraham. Three days, a journey, a three days journey. He had plenty of time to contemplate backing out. You can just think of some of the excuses that Abraham could have come up with. You, Lord, that's a three days journey. What's wrong with offering the sacrifice right here? Okay, he's going to follow through with it. But what's wrong with doing it right here? Or, Lord, we are weary from the journey. We're not able to sacrifice. We're too tired. Or any number of excuses. The Bible neither records nor alludes to any hesitancy on Abraham's part. We are told that he arose early and started on the journey. He was eager to start the trip. He was eager to obey the Lord's command. The fact that the place of sacrifice was a great distance demonstrates the completeness of the trial, I believe, and Abraham's faithfulness faithfulness to the Lord's command. Such great faith is demonstrated here by Abraham. What a wonderful example to us in times of trial. Our faith will see us through to help us endure trials. Some of the practical applications so far, faith is the key to enduring trials. Faith is the key to understanding temptations. Uh, any questions so far, any comments so far? Okay, let's go on down to the next part here, verse 14 and verse 15 of James chapter 1. But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then what, when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. So let's break that down. So temptation, what is temptation? Where does it come from? Temptation is rooted in one's own inward desire or the lust to satisfy oneself. If you dwell on that, then more, more often than not, we're soon swept away into sin. Now, sin is pleasurable. We talked about that Sunday in Ron's lesson. Otherwise, why would people want to do it? We need to remember that sin's fulfillment is death, eternal spiritual death left unchecked, and sometimes it's physical death, or both. Some sins only require a mental action, the sin of adultery. The temptation itself is not a sin, only if one gives into it, follows through. Apatello, it's been a while since I've studied Greek, <laughs> so forgive me if I, if I pronounce this wrong. Some of you more scholarly guys can tell me if that's how it's pronounced. Is that right? Apotello? I'm going to put you on the spot, Ron. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, Paul. When sin is accomplished. Uh, so that's the, the you know, the, um, what's the word I'm looking for here? The end result of the temptation, dwelling on it, you swept away into sin, and then the fulfillment of that sin is eternal spiritual death and sometimes physical death. Unrepented sin brings forth Spiritual death, Luke 13, 3. I tell you, no, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Uh, yes? I was just, when you were going through that notes, I was just thinking, I mean, after he sacrificed the goat, he got <coughs> and God tells him, why are you so downcast? For God, do better and you, you will be justified. And, and otherwise, turn this child to me. I said, whoa, wait a minute. I mean, it's, 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 this is <coughs> something that's been back in almost every <coughs> morning. So. Right. Right, that's a, that's a great example. He had the opportunity to turn around, but he was so hard-hearted hard -hearted that he, he didn't. But he could have. So it's, it's really the ball is in our court, I would say. Uh, we, we have the choice to go and, and follow through with the, with the temptation and sin, or we can nip it in the bud, as we say, or stop it and cut it off at the roots. And that's, that's up to us, and we're not always successful at that. We can't say, Romans tells us that if we say we have no sin, we, we're a liar and God is not in us. We, we do, unfortunately, but we have that. 1 John chapter 1, 7 tells us that if we walk in the light as he is in the light, his blood cleanses us from all sin. And, and so that's the... Um, the great part about that. Ivan? Uh, I think, you know, faith has so much to do with sin, and that's, that's the only way that we really know what our faith is, 
it's easier to say, well, if that ever happened to me, I would do this. But usually, if it does happen to us, we don't do what we thought we would do. And so mm -hmm. it, it all has to do with faith because if our faith, obviously, we don't have the faith that we need in God, then we are going to fall to these temptations. Excellent point. That's, that's 100%. That's kind of the underpinnings of the book of James. Uh, that faith, you know, faith is the key to enduring trials. Faith is key to understanding temptations. That, yeah, I think faith is very good. Uh, that's a very good comment. That that is exactly what we're we're talking about here. Verse sixteen: Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. So, if you break this down, do not. It's a choice. We have a choice. We can be deceived, or we cannot be deceived. Of course, deception doesn't come from God. It comes from Satan. He's uh, the father of lies. He's the all-deceiving one. We are responsible for our actions. You know, I don't know if you, some of the younger people may not have ever heard of this comedian, but I'm sure you've heard of Flip Wilson, but he always used to say, the devil made me do it, so I can't help it. You know, he made me do this. Well, he didn't make you do it. You let him you let him influence you to the point where you did it. And he's trying to cop out, I think, of, hey, I, I can't help I did that. You know, the devil made me do it. I had, my hands were tied. I couldn't stop him. Well, that's not really true. James further indicates his love for the brethren by describing them as beloved. Verse 17, every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. So God's very nature is love, and his gifts reflect his love for us. God's character is flawless, constant, unchanging. Earthly objects cast shadows that are continually changing in relation to the earth's turning, not the sun's. A little bit of a play on the words there. The sun, that is Christ, is consistent in his nature. So the earth is turning, and then an object will cast a shadow, depending on where this, it's in relation to the sun. But God and the sun are consistent in their nature. There is no changing of the shadow. There's no variation of his, quote-unquote, shadow. Verse 18, in the exercise of his will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, so that we would be a kind of first fruits among his creatures. God's will has always been that his word would plant the seed to produce children of God. And the early converts are often referred to as the first fruits of the gospel. And I meant to do some more study and research on that term, first fruits of the gospel. Um, I'll, I'll try to do that here and get some more information on that for us sometime in the future. But I didn't elaborate too much on that. But um, that's the imp everybody's important. Uh, the first fruits are kind of... What I was thinking was the first fruits of a farmer's uh, crop, and he goes out and all his efforts, and here's these beautiful tomatoes and these beautiful plums and apples or whatever. He has corn, and it's just like, wow, you know, that's, that's great. Those are the first fruits of my labors, of the seeds that I planted, and here they are, and now I can take them and eat them, and I can uh, nourish myself with them. That's kind of went, went through my head, but uh, if you have any other comments, feel free to mention that. If not, we'll go on. Uh, so here's where I wanted to start. So <laughs> we may not get through it again this week. Time's running out again. Um, chapter 1, verse 19 through 25. Verse 19 and 20. This you know, my beloved brethren, but everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. So we break this down. Quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. These qualities will help us to endure and overcome trials. Quick to hear, meaning in this context, meaning quick to hear God's word. Slow to speak, a word spoken in anger may not be wise. Take time to ensure your words of doctrine are true to the word in context. Take time to make sure your words of doctrine, the things that you speak, are true to the word. Don't just rifle off something off the top of your head but make sure you're teaching or you're speaking the, the truth, what's, what God wants us to, to understand. And if somebody wants to flip over to Proverbs 10, 19 real quick, 
and read that. It's a short verse, Proverbs 10, 19. Okay, let's go ahead. In the multitude of wars, sin is not lacking, but he who restrains his lips is wise. Okay, thank you, Mark. The um, NASV translates it, when there are many words, transgression is unavoidable, but he who restrains his lips is wise. So choose your words carefully. Make sure that they are the ones that you want to use. You can't take those back. Yes, Sam. Uh, Mike, you mentioned uh, scripture here that uh, being ready to listen to the word of God, which, which I think is, is true in, in, under the, the umbrella of what it really is saying is that we just need to be ready to listen to one another. Uh, and it, it, I don't think it's you know, directed just that listening to the word of God, but it's about being willing and ready to listen to other people and hear what they have to say. You, know, you look at our, our political landscape, our uh, everything that's going on in our society and our culture, and the one thing that we don't seem to be doing is listening to one another. And the one thing that, that to me would be a great answer to a lot of the social ills that we face is to listen. Very good. Very good. I'm going to write that down because I think that's that's very, very good. <coughs> There's a lot of quabbling going on right now for sure. <laughs> and uh, it's not a very pleasant political scene right now. But, um, yep, that makes a lot of sense to me. Listen to each other. Lean on your brother or sister under trials and uh, all kinds of, when they're happy, you know, rejoice with those that rejoice, cry with those that are crying, and uh, just be there for everybody. That's what, it, that's what it's all about. Love, right? <laughs> Christianity is, is love. And thank you, Sam. That was excellent. Uh, let's see here. Slow to anger. A quick temper could lead us to say or do something unwise. I think we've all probably... Uh, fallen trap to that. I know I have. The anger of man. Well, who, you know, who is man? Man's anger is an unjust anger. God's anger is just. We're, we're fallible. God is infallible. His, his, his anger is, how do I say it, is, is just. <laughs> it's complete. It's perfect. We can be angry for a reason that's not even a reason or not even just what we think is a reason for us to be angry, but God would never do that because he's the only perfect, he's the only perfect one. His anger would be a just anger. Verse 21, therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness, in humility receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. So you look at that, therefore, the aforementioned statements are true and because of this, it's generally what that word means, Putting aside all filthiness, put aside all filthiness and wickedness from your focus. Just take it out of your vision. You know, just don't don't look to it. Get, keep your vision sharp. Keep your vision clear. Put all that stuff aside. Humility, having a humble attitude toward hearing and doing God's will. We need to be humble people. We need to hear the word of God if there's something that we um, realize that we are not doing or we have been doing, let's just say that we shouldn't be or we should be, have that humble heart and say, okay, I'm going to make those changes. I didn't realize it in the past, but I realize it now, and I'm going to make those changes. Be humble. Don't be proud or haughty. Um, have a humble attitude toward hearing and doing God's will. To receive the word implanted. To have the proper attitude toward the word implanted in your soul, allow it to penetrate your whole being and grow, which is able to save your souls, sanctify them in the truth. Thy word is truth, John 17, 17. To be sanctified, to be cleansed, to be set apart, 
to be sanctified by the word, which is true. Let's go on to page 8. Verse 22, but prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers only who delude themselves. Prove yourself doers of the word. Your actions and deeds will reveal this. Not merely hearers who delude themselves. Hearing the word is essential, of course, but doing God's will is another matter. Delusion. Deluding themselves. Delusion. We live in a world filled with delusion. Everywhere we turn, everywhere we look, it's all about delusion, right? Uh, everything, it's just, you know, it's, it's really sickening when you think about it. Everybody's out to get everybody else and pull the wool over their eyes uh, to delude them, to get away with something. It's just everywhere we turn. You can't get away from it every day. So we, we don't want to delude ourselves. Remember, we're in the world, but we're not of the world. We're a peculiar people. Don't let the world delude us. Self-delusion can be the most insidious, dangerous form of delusion. I think we would probably all would agree with that, that we can delude ourselves and not, not realize it sometimes, and somebody else may have to point it out to us. Uh, it's one of the hardest ones to, I think, recognize and then to correct. Verse 23 and 24, if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of man he was or what kind of person he was. So think of a man that wakes up, looks at his face in the mirror, and I'm not talking about myself here at all. <laughs> he understands that he needs to shave, wash his face, comb his hair. Well, some of us have to comb our hair. <laughs> not all of us. <laughs> But he does nothing and leaves for the day. Well, you know, I need to wash my face. I need to shave. I need to brush my teeth. I need to comb my hair. Yeah, I know I need to do that, but I'm not going to do it. So can we call this person a doer of what is indicated by the mirror? What's his reflection? Is he a doer of the word? Or rather, a doer of what he needs to do? So in context here, James is using a metaphor for God's word. In this instance, he's using a mirror, a mirror into one's soul. What we say and what we do must be a mirror image, a sharp, clear image with no deviation. We look at God's word, the mirror, and we make adjustments to align ourselves with it. We look at it and say, you know what? I've been doing this or thinking this for years, and you know, I just figured, found out that that was wrong. And we need to say, okay, be humble enough to make those changes and uh, to do something uh, about that. But one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. One who looks intently at the perfect law of liberty and abides by it, James here is contrasting the one who looks and does nothing, like the guy that looks in the mirror in the morning and does nothing about it, with someone who looks and realizes what is needed and follows through. He actually does what's needed. The perfect law of liberty, God's word is perfect, able to discern the hearts of men, able to save souls, also by which all will be judged. The law of liberty, Old Testament law, was the law of sin and death. New Testament law is one of liberty in Christ. He shed his blood for the forgiveness of mankind's sins once and for all, for all, for all eternity, uh, from, from, the end, from the beginning to the end is what I'm trying to say. Not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, a forgetful hearer could be described as one who takes an information in one ear and lets it go right out the other. So we all know people like that. Maybe we've done that ourselves. You, you learn something and it kind of just goes right through, you know, like there's doesn't get trapped in the middle there. It just kind of goes right through. Uh, yes, Mark. Exactly. What good is it if you know something and you don't you don't do anything about it? I think first uh, Paul and then Ivan. Okay. Wait a minute, Andrew, but um, you know all of it. I think the key of this is the humility. Yep. Because if if you are not humble enough to accept God's word, you're just walking up hill, pulling pulling the face off. Because when you cannot get to the humility side of it, you're never going. 
think. You know what's best. You got it covered. You can handle it. It's all up to me. And until that wall breaks, that's, I mean, that's, to me, that's the key to this, this chapter is that mm-hmm. you're not humble. You, you don't accept that it's what God has told you because he's a higher being than you are. It's, it's all me. I got this. That's, to get to the end. that's exactly right. We have to be humble. Uh, we, we can't do it ourselves, and we will only fail if we try. Uh, Ivan? Uh, I was going to say, I think a lot of this is kind of a habit. As we look in the uh, mirror the same thing over and over, yeah. it becomes a habit when you're no longer paying any attention to it. Yeah. And I think any, I know when I used to close the store, I'd have to do something a little bit different. Or I'd get home and I'd think, you know, I lost the store tonight. Or I think yeah. I yeah. Oh, yeah. So I do some little thing, you know, maybe take something out of my pocket and put it back or something. Yeah. So I would remember those other little things. And you get in the habit yeah. of looking at yourself, looking at ourselves in a certain way. Or hearing a yeah. sermon, we go and we hear we need to do this, and we need to do this, and it mm-hmm. becomes a yep, yep. Yep. Thing. Yep. It has, you're right, you know, humility is, it, we have to have the right attitude. And we have to have a humble attitude. And again, we have to have the attitude of Christ. He was the ultimate, obviously. He was humble. He loved everybody. And he he's the key. You know, I don't know how else to say it. But you know, have, the attitude of, have this attitude in you that was in Christ. We need to have his attitude and, and mirror him as, uh, in, our, in our walk. So, yeah, very good. I remember when I used to work at uh, Aeroworks in Aurora, and I lived up here in Brighton, I had to uh, close the building up. And more than once, I drove all the way back down to 54th and Chambers or whatever it was to go and make sure the building was locked. And sure enough, it was locked. It always is. It always is, yeah. But, it, you know, it just felt I couldn't sleep unless I knew for sure it was locked. I just didn't want that on my conscience. Somebody could have walked in and just stole everything off the shelf. But, yeah, we, we, the key is to be humble, is to, uh, and we are creatures of habit, let's face it. We are. And that's one of our struggles, I think. We have to, some habits are good, some habits are bad. But we, we have to realize that we, we have habits. We do things a certain way all the time. And is it, you know, make sure it's the right habit. Make sure it's, we're doing the right thing. Um, an effectual doer, that's the last sentence here, one who hears the word, you can describe that as one who hears the word and shows his faith by following, by following through, it should be following, by following through uh, and doing it. So hear it, you know, and do it. Make the practical application. Uh, let's see here. Let's go to page nine. I think we'll just get through this tonight. This man will be blessed in what he does. Example, John 13, 17. Jesus knew the right thing to do, and in this instance, it was to wash the disciples' feet. He knew the right thing to do, but did he stop there? No, he followed through by performing the task. Do we wish to be blessed in what we do? Then let us hear and do the will of God. So the practical applications from this section, faith obeys the word, and faith produces doers. And of course, James is going to go on to talk about faith and works, of course, in chapters, uh, chapter 2 uh, and further. So you can read that later at home. Verse 26, if anyone thinks himself to be religious and yet does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is worthless. The King James Version uses the word vain for worthless. The King James Version also starts off, if any man among you seems seem to be religious and yet does not bridle his tongue, uh, this man's religion is, is vain. If anyone thinks himself to be religious, if anyone who calls himself a follower of God, apparently at this time they were teachers with selfish motives for claiming to know God but teaching their own doctrine. And that's something that we all have to be on the lookout for. So a person calls themselves religious or seems to be religious, but they're, they're in it for their own glory, so to speak. They're in it for their own uh, 
reward. They're not to please, they're not in to please God, but they're rather, they're drawing people after them. They want the praise and adoration of people rather than God. And you know, you turn on your television and you can see countless people on the television, just, uh, you know, Joel Olstein and um, Billy Graham before he passed and his son now and all just scores of people. And they're, they're not teaching the doctrines of God, but they're rather they're teaching doctrines that will make them popular, will make them seem important. And uh, they call themselves religious, religious, but they're teaching their own doctrine, not the doctrine of God. Uh, yes. Super, super, super critical. I, I agree 100%. I think we would all agree with that. You know, there are, there are times that we, we have weak moments, and hopefully they're less and less and less as we mature in our Christian life, but you don't want to have somebody claim to be a follower of Christ and then having them certainly not, you know, spewing uh, foul language out of their mouth. I think James is alluding to foul language in, in a little bit later, but here he's, the words he's talking about, speaking the true word of God, I think, is more of what he's talking about in this area, um, and yet does not bridle his tongue. We use a bridle to control a horse's response. In the same way, we must bridle our tongue. In other words, control our tongue. And that means the words that we use, pure, good words, and also the doctrine, the words that we teach with, the words that we say in our everyday walk of life, in our manner of life, we need to bridle those. You don't just let a horse run free. You have a bridle on the horse so you can control him where you want him to go. Uh, same thing with, with our words. We, we need to bridle, those, bridle our tongue, control our tongue, let our brain tell our tongue what to say. Uh, what is the old saying, engage the brain before <laughs> opening the mouth? Um, we've all slipped there. I have. We put our... What did they say? Open your mouth and insert your foot. We've all done that. But James is telling us here to be, to be wary of that. Yeah, if you, you, know, you claim to be a Christian and you're at work and people hear you talking like everybody else, or uh, if you're not an unusual, peculiar person in all aspects of your life, not in just in this building, but it's certainly in, out in the world is where it's you know, vitally important, then we're deceiving ourselves and our religion is vain. We certainly don't want to have a, a vain religion. Uh, verse 27, pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. Pure and undefiled religion is this. The only religion acceptable to God would be a pure, undefiled religion or mannerism of life. We can't have a defiled and unpure uh, religion, mannerism of life, and be pleasing to God. To visit orphans and widows in their distress, to have a charitable, loving, kind attitude toward those that are under distress. Um, we think of our parents, we think they've raised us, they've sacrificed everything for us, and to then turn our backs on them as they uh, are widows or are older, would be, would be a very, very bad thing for us to do. We need to take care of the widows. Uh, we need to visit the orphans, those that are less fortunate, those that are uh, needing, uh, needing visitors, those that are needing attention and love and care. We need to do that because Christ would do it, after all. This is what he would be doing. 
The last one, to keep oneself unstained and unspotted from the world. That's, that involves quite a bit of self-reflection. Um, are we really keeping ourselves as best as we, with God's help, of course, and forgiveness, unstained and unspotted from the world? The main thing is the attitude. You realize that there's something that needs to be changed and you make the change. Uh, we all fall. We all fall short. Um, we don't like it. Uh, it should bother us. If it doesn't bother us, there's a problem. But if it bothers us, okay, face it and change it be, so we can be uh, pleasing to the sight and sight of God. So summary, it looks like it's going to work out just perfect here. <laughs> um, the summary, yes, trials have their place and purpose in our lives. They're not always pleasant, but we need to think of them as a means of strengthening our faith in God and his eternal promises. We're, we're to, James says we're to count it as all joy. As, you know, as joy that we have these trials because they help to build us up. They help to uh, prove to ourselves and to God that we, we can get through this. We're ready for the next trial. Um, so look at them as not as a drudgery so much, uh, but look at them as an opportunity to show that we can do what God wants us to do and we can continue on. Always remember, this is the good, a good point, we do not have to go through trials alone. God grants wisdom for trials, James 1, verse 5. He's always there. He's listening. His phone is always on. Uh, it's always turned on. The volume is always turned up, unlike mine. I get calls all the time, and I didn't hear it. <laughs> but his is always on. He's listening all the time, and he wants to, he wants to hear from us, and he will help us with anything. Remember, God does not tempt anyone, verse 13. Let no one say, I'm being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, and he does not tempt anyone. God's pure, sinless nature will not allow him to, to tempt mankind. He will let us go through trials. And again, that's to, to uh, strengthen ourselves. Temptation is not, itself is not a sin. It only becomes a sin if one gives into it. Trials are, are to be endured. Temptations are to be resisted. That's a good statement there. It sums it up. Trials are to be endured. Endure it, get through it, but resist temptations. A trial can turn into a temptation. Um, you know, you turn on television, and then there's almost always some sort of... Uh, provocative um, picture of a woman, or usually it's a woman, on television. And I can't even, I, my wife, I'm like, give me, change it. I don't want to see it. Because if you look at that for more than a, a second or two, then you start, the th you know, you're, you can go drift off, and then you can be, that trial has turned into a temptation, and you can commit sin. So cut the trial off right there, nip it in the bud, and you won't go any farther with it. Faith is vitally important in a Christian's life. Without it, we cannot be pleasing to God, John 8 and 24. Faith is the key to enduring trials. Faith is the key to understanding temptations. Faith obeys the word. Faith produces doers. Control our tongue, and we must be doers of the word and not merely hearers only. And I'm sure there's a lot more we could add to that, but um, I think that's the main uh, thrust of, of what we've discussed and uh, talked about. So if, we, if you have any questions as we close out, any comments? I like your comments and questions. Anybody have anything to add? Paul? I agree 100%, and I have been in many congregations in my life, and I have seen a severe lack of exactly what you just said. I have seen it severely. I, I have. And um, I, 
that's vital. That's very, very, very important. And again, I think it's because uh, Ron Hennon's lesson, we're Americans. We can do this. We don't need anybody's help. We can do it, you know? And then that transla overs, uh, translates over into our, our relationship with God. We think, you know, that's a very good point. And I think we all can uh, in, in work on that ourselves and to be what we're supposed to be, do what we're supposed to do and be what we can be. And you can't do it alone. I know I personally, I've been through some struggles and I've, I thought, you know, I tried that and it's again and I knew better and um, you just, it won't work. You can't do it. You won't be successful. And so uh, with that, we will close and um, Ivan, would you lead us in a quick prayer, closing prayer? Our God and Father, we're so thankful that you do love us and that you do care for us and that you give us the opportunity to share your word. We pray that you would be with each of us as we strive in our lives and our faith in our growing strength and our desire to please you in, in everything that we do. We pray that you will help each of us now as we live our lives. Encourage us and strengthen us. And we pray this all in